shared the link. Perfect. Uh, if you're ready, take it away. Okay, thank you, Steph. So I'm going to try to share my screen here, and it's going to be this one. Okay. <clears throat> so the, let me uh, reduce this. Okay. The paper that I would like to talk about today, it's a fairly recent one. It came out at the beginning of the year uh, in Nature Communications. And uh, it's titled Segment Anything in Medical Images. So the title is quite eloquent and uh, in Double checking that's her Wi Fi cutting out, right? Sorry? We just lost you there for a minute. If you want to start again. Uh, your Wi-Fi is cutting out. Oh, okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, no, it's good. Try again. Okay, let's see. So, yeah, uh, medical image segmentation um, basically consists uh, in uh, defining some, uh, some regions from medical images. And uh, these uh, regions can represent uh, organs or uh, lesions. Uh, and they are very useful in the in the clinical practice because they are used, uh, for example, for uh, preoperative planning or to see the progression of a disease in time. Uh, normally, what is done is that there is a, an expert operator that is uh, manually delineating these regions, and uh, this is a, you can assume that this is a very time consuming uh, process and that it requires a lot of expertise. So different deep learning models have been applied to this task. Uh, the thing is that these models are very specific uh, by definition, so they, they can be applied to data that are uh, very similar to the ones that they were trained on. Uh, but uh, the authors introduced these uh, second types of model that are the uh, segmentation foundation models. And uh, basically they're used for natural image segmentation. And uh, in uh, more in detail, they talk about this segment anything model. That is a model that is literally used to segment uh, anything in natural images. So uh, the idea is that they want to apply this uh, segment anything model to uh, medical images. Uh, there are two main uh, uh, shortcuts uh, to this model. Uh, so the fact that it does not uh, act uh, that much well uh, when it comes to defining borders that are not uh, with a great contrast. So uh, this is the, the presentation of uh, what we are talking about. You can see that uh, we are not talking about uh, only the, the brain. We are not uh, talking about only MRI, uh, but uh, we are talking about the images from different modalities uh, for different organs. And you can see that uh, they are used uh, also for pathology images or to segment uh, medical tools uh, from uh, um, endoscopic images. So the idea is that uh, um, the, this foundation model is trained on a very large amount of data. We are talking about a data set with 1,570,263 medical images. And these images are all paired uh, with uh, a mask, an annotation of a region of interest that is the one that needs to be segmented. So uh, the, as I showed you here, but maybe it's better to see it here, uh, there are uh, different modalities that uh, were comprised uh, into this uh, data set, uh, among which uh, MRI, CT, and endoscopy are the most represented ones. But there are also ultrasound, X-ray, pathology, fundus, dermoscopy, mammography, and OCT. The main problems uh, that the authors needed to overcome are related to the fact that when you input an image, you need to define what is the target of segmentation. So, uh, for example, if you give uh, the image of an abdomen, you need to, to say which is the organ of interest for you. Um, and then the second problem is that uh, while uh, images such as MR and CT result in 3D images, some other modalities result in 2D images. So uh, what the authors decided to do is to treat uh, 3D images as 2D images, so using uh, the different slices and applying the segmentation to each of them. 
And uh, then for what concerns uh, uh, the, the specification of the target to be segmented, uh, they introduce this concept of uh, bounding box. So to define uh, where the organ or the lesion of interest uh, is, uh, is located in the image. So I can try to tell you how the model was done, but <laughs> it's gonna be yeah, very general. Uh, they have three main players that are this image encoder, the prompt encoder, and the master encoder. Basically, from what I got, the image of the encoder um, puts uh, the, the image that is given as an input into a high dimensional uh, image embedding space. Uh, the prompt encoder, on the other hand, uh, takes the bounding box uh, that are designed by the, the user and uh, uh, transforms them, them into features that are then used by the master coder together with the embedded image uh, to trace, uh, let's say, this uh, whole uh, segmentation. This is all that I can say about the model, so uh, don't ask me, please. And um, yeah, uh, in order to see, to test whether this, uh, this method is good or not, of course, they did uh, some tests, uh, and uh, what they did was to evaluate the internal and the external validity of the model uh, compared to other models. The models that they use for comparison are uh, the segment anything model, uh, that are that is the one that uh, I talked about uh, before, the one used on uh, uh, naturalistic images. And uh, then they decided to do um, a comparison with uh, two specialist models uh, that are UNET and uh, DeepLab V3+. Plus. And uh, for what concerns the internal validation, um, which is basically using the model to segment images that are part uh, of the training data set. They are not used for training, but so let's say from the initial data set, they take uh, part of the data set uh, for training, part for fine tuning, and then part for testing. Uh, but uh, the, the, the claim is that uh, the, these images are randomly sampled, so they are very similar to the ones that the model is tested on. And we can see here, they calculate the uh, dice uh, similarity coefficient. And uh, you can see here it's uh, MedSum, that is the name of this, uh, of this new model. Um, basically has a narrower distribution of uh, similarity coefficient compared to the annotations uh, that are uh, manually annotated from the initial data set. And uh, you can also see that it's very high. The, high. Uh, the, maybe the worst uh, performing model is the segment anything model, uh, while the two specialist models uh, perform uh, quite good, uh, but uh, still made some uh, perform betters, better. Um, you can see here some examples uh, of segmentation. I will try to zoom in. So in pink, uh, there is the outline of the segmentation that is performed uh, by the, the expert operator. Here you see the one from uh, UNET and DeepLab, and uh, eventually you see the one from MedSum. There is a main problem with uh, some that uh, uh, basically under or overestimates uh, the the, the lesion or the, 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 the organ of interest uh, because uh, it's not very good at defining the, the borders uh, based on the contrast. On the other hand, uh, here you see that there are some missing spots and stuff. Uh, MedSum performs better overall. Uh, you can see that there should be some fine tuning uh, to be done uh, eventually. So uh, yeah, this is uh, other applications, similar uh, brain tumor, and then uh, this image, uh, not sure of what it is, but you can see that it's not uh, uh, like a normal radiological image, uh, could be endoscopic maybe. Um, and uh, then uh, for what concerns the external validation, they did uh, basically the same, but uh, they trained the model on the data set, and then they tested it uh, on a totally different uh, uh, data set with uh, completely different uh, tasks. So about that, uh, there is more or less the same pattern. So some uh, performs uh, worse uh, compared to the others. And then uh, the two specialist models uh, performed uh, okay-ish, uh, but worse uh, compared, to, compared to before. Uh, and then with some uh, performs better than them. The idea is that the also the specialist model 
since they are specialists, uh, are less able to generalize to, to new types of, uh, of images that they have not been trained on. Medsum is not performing that bad. Uh, then let's see what's happening. Uh, they did this uh, validation analysis and uh, yeah, they also tried to see uh, how the model performed in uh, changing the size uh, of the data set. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the performance uh, depends highly on the size of the data set. So for this foundation model, it's very important to have a, a huge amount of data to be, to be trained on. And uh, going to the uh, effective application of the model, uh, they also did a qualitative study on how uh, this, uh, this model can improve the efficiency of, uh, of the annotation in the clinics. So they selected two experts uh, and they asked them to manually segment uh, some, uh, some images. Uh, the manual segmentation consisted in uh, drawing the, the lesion uh, for each slice uh, as it is normally done. On the other hand, uh, the second protocol that was carried out with uh, med the MedSum assistance consisted in a first uh, um, action from the operator, which he needed to draw the main axis uh, of the lesion. Uh, then uh, they had uh, these axes were used uh, to create uh, the bounding box uh, for MedSum to, to be used. And eventually, as we saw in the in the first image, uh, there could be the need to manually refine the region of interest. So they took some time to refine the region of interest uh, uh, up to the point that they were satisfied with it. And uh, you can see that there is uh, like a, a huge decrease for both experts uh, in the time that is required for the segmentation. So this is more or less uh, all that I have to say. Um, I'm sorry that I haven't tried it. Uh, I saw that they have, uh, uh, maybe I can share. Da -da -da. They uh, make the code available and also they um, propose um, not supplementary. This one, okay, you can see it here. This is their GitHub page and uh, they make all the code available, but also there was a section uh, that included uh, uh, GUI, so it's not uh, only based on a code to run uh, from terminal, but uh, uh, it also gives uh, like a user-friendly interface to to act on it that is great in Linux. So uh, yeah, that's all. If you have any question, I will try to answer. Not to models question, though. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Very exciting. And hands were up before you even finished. So <laughs> I give the floor to Chris. Sure. Hi, thank you for the, the presentation. Um, so uh, in the validation measures, um, I heard you mentioned the dice. Was there another measure to uh, evaluate the performance of the, of the models? So uh, I don't think so. I saw that they did another type of, maybe not analysis. Maybe yes, it is an analysis, but yeah, uh, I'm a bit. Uh... So I saw uh, this type of, no, it's still based on dissimilarity coefficient. Uh, it's just another right. way of uh, presenting the data and uh, yes. ranking plot. So, so what, uh, what I would say is that it might be a problem because um, so there are some papers that show the uh, the shortcomings of uh, dice. For example, dice is um, uh, dice is capturing the overlap between the target and the prediction. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the problem is that if you have a big target, um, dice will not capture a sm a small. Um, miss segmentation that can be completely off, completely uh, outside of the, the area because uh, um, DICE is uh, using the, is comparing also the quantity of overlap. So if your overlap is 95%, your DICE is 95%. But if you have 5% of your uh, segmentation, your prediction, 
that is completely outside that could be another organ or depending on your task, but it could be really bad. Uh, so there is some kind of, I mean, I would say that there is a kind of crisis in the the medical imaging, um, the machine learning in medical imaging because uh, of the use of very crude measures to uh, um, evaluate the performance that are not really um, reflective of the performance that uh, you would have in a clinical setting. Um, and the, 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 the small thing that they could have uh, uh, looked at would be the distance um, between what's segmented and the, the target, the grand truth of the segmentation, because it gives a complementary um, information to the dice, because it's not as much as affected with the volume than the dice, but it is still, still not perfect. So, so people have to be careful with the results of papers uh, uh, sh showing only the dice, because there is no way to know if, I mean, you talked about uh, uh, um, over uh, segmentation, um, and that's typically something that the dice is not very good at capturing. Okay. Yeah, I don't know much about that. Uh, I could be, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I read the, the main text uh, in the supplementary. It seems to me that there is more tables and stuff. Um, I think that's actually the only measure that they used to to compare, to to validate uh, internally the and also externally the, the the models. So yes, that's one. Yeah, one. So, so people have to be careful when uh, if the paper is saying, oh, that can be used in the, for the clinic. Uh, Dice is not enough to validate that at all. Good to know. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Evie, do you want to comment on that or you have a different question? Uh, no, it's a, it's a different question. Um, it's, um, it's to clarify things. Um, just to know, so so we work more on the on the brain so i was wondering which kind of data they use for the brain uh, mainly i think they use only uh, monomodal so unimodal imaging they didn't use multimodal segmentation for for this kind of uh, stuff or did they try different uh, different things okay so let's see maybe in the supplementary thing there was a table about that let's see if i can get it um, oh, this is a PDF. Can find can find my Safari tab anymore. Let's see. I will share just this. Okay, and then here. So, uh, okay. Here are the different data sets that they used, and apparently they are all. Uh, like freely available on the on the internet, and let's see if I can see anything for what is the brain? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Brain tumor, okay. Brain stroke, brain tumor, brain lesion, and it's gonna be uh, MRT yeah. one, MR, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, the FT one, T two, but they didn't notice or they they didn't explain. If they use multimodal, because for brain brain segmentation and for tumor segmentation, it could be very useful. I don't know if they uh, they did some stuff on that or they just use all the the data they got and. Uh... Yeah, I think it was uh, all the data that they got from this, and uh, not uh, I I don't know if I got what you mean. So if there was uh, like a cross interaction between two different modalities of imaging. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering because I'm just. Thinking if, uh, so this is a very uh, large or um, uniform uh, framework to segment brain tumors everywhere in the, brain, uh, in, the in the body. And I was thinking if a specialized uh, software is more, is more refined uh, on the brain tumors specifically, okay. because what they compare is something also very general. So I want, I, want, I was wondering if something very specific will uh, overachieve uh, as compared to this uh, to this general uh, framework. 
Sure. So the the two specialized specialist models that they tried are these ones, UNET and Deep Lab, blah blah blah. But um, but they are not specialized for brain tumor. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And not for brains, but for yeah. uh yeah, for specific to an organ. Uh, yeah, so it, uh, it could be that uh, if using, uh, if considering one specific uh, modality for one specific uh, task, uh, the specialist model would be would be better performing compared to, to this one. Could be. Could be. <laughs> we need to test it. <laughs> we need to test it. It would also be interesting, especially for stroke. In, in table two, you showed that they used mainly T1s and T2s for yeah. the pathologies. Um, but then for the ischemic strokes, they also use the diffusion series. It's table two is done. Oops, sorry. Here we go. So you see brain stroke is a T1 tumor and general lesion is a T1 as well, I guess. Um, and then you have halfway through the list, you have the ischemic stroke lesions, which is then the DWI and T2, basically. Um but it would also be interesting to, especially with, with the clinical hat on, the, the DWI is more sensitive to stroke than the T1. It can take up to 24 hours on the T1 to actually see the lesion. So using the multimodality to segment those pathologies would actually be uh, quite advantageous if that hasn't been done in this context. Given the pathology of interest. Yeah. Great, great point. I'm surprised that they got so many images. Um, you said they're all openly available. Did they um, specify how they gathered all these images? So let me read. I think it's here uh, in the methods. So data set curation and pre-processing, uh, collating images from publicly available medical image segmentation data sets. Uh, and then there is the definition of uh, where they got it. Uh, and uh, I guess Mika is a big, uh, uh, let's say, uh, society. Uh, so they were able maybe to, to get a lot of images from there. And uh, yeah, they just say that uh, they, they, they are freely available and they need a bit of uh, uh, quality check, uh, quality insurance of the data to see if the annotations actually match the, uh, the, the, the target of segmentation and stuff. But uh, yeah, it seems to me that they are freely available. Amazing. And <clears throat> given that these are freely available data sets, obviously the acquisition and the scanner parameters and all that will... Yeah greatly vary. Did they also touch on the different types of resolutions, 1.5, 3 Tesla, those kind of differences? Uh, I have no idea about that. It does not uh, recall me anything about it. Uh, they did some uh, fine tuning of the, um, let's say, the contrast and luminosity of the images, mainly because these uh, being a, like a a model that was born for acting on uh, RGB images. Um, I'm not sure, maybe, I, I'm not sure how it's working. So um, I, I could not really understand the details. Uh, but yeah, I'm wondering whether it's acting at a different level. So the, the discrepancy uh, between uh, the voxel size of the images uh, does not matter. Because I guess that reviewers would have pointed that out if it was not uh, written in the main text, I guess. Um, well, it depends on what the focus was in the end. Mm. But um, like having segmented quite a few images, the, the sharper your image, the better it is or the easier it is to segment. So then I guess we come down to how specialized is the algorithm to segment specific parts um, within an organ. Uh, Lilith has her hand up. Yeah. Uh, first of all, or, uh, first of all, thank you. It was really interesting paper. Uh, so yeah, about uh, the availability of data sets. Just a comment. Uh, 
Kaggle, it's a really good platform, actually. Uh, there are a lot of competitions happening constantly, and there are lots of data sets that they provide. So that's why I wasn't so much surprised that they found, because obviously there are not so many uh, images of the brain, but uh, I saw there are lots of, for, I don't know, CT scans uh, for... Uh, I don't know, breast cancer model to, and then they pay, I don't know, $50,000 for the winner. So there are lots of things and it's really available. Uh, you just can subscribe for free to participate in, in a competition and just try your skills. So yeah, that is that. And the second part, so as I understand, uh, this model was not based on a specific architecture that was known before, or is it just a random way, or they used some uh, ideas from uh, established networks that work, like UNET, for example. But as I understand, it's kind of not the same. Or... Uh, from what I got, they use the same architecture of these uh... SAM uh, foundation model. So they literally apply that and then they do some fine tuning by uh, introducing the use of the of the bounding box on uh, how to approach the images on increasing the, the data set. So I guess that the overall structure of the model was already there. Mm. Uh, but but yes, what I... was uh, different exactly? Right. Ah. Only the amount of data set and variability of the data set. That they Not very sure about that. I will invite you to check it out because uh, maybe you can probably understand more than me about that. So I don't know. And, <laughs> and uh, another thing is about the resolution. I think when you have such a huge data set, it doesn't matter anymore for the deep learning, such deep learning models. So they somehow magically understand uh, things. So, <laughs> so maybe that's why there were no uh, kind of treating that, uh, that idea. But yeah, I think maybe if you can treat it, it can improve the model. But uh, even without that, uh, models can segment uh, in the natural world uh, a lot of objects, even in a noisy images, I think so. No, that was really great. Uh, so, and it is also new, as I understand, right? It was published. Yes. Uh... In January, it came out. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Exciting. Um, I just, I was just wondering, it's not often that we hear something as magical in this <laughs> trying to come. <laughs> so this is definitely a new one from Lilith. Um, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. That was a super exciting paper. Thanks for presenting it. And I hope you all have an exciting week in science. And I'll see you next Monday. Bye.